All right, it's one o'clock. Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacy McKenna and I will be moderating today's discussion. We are pleased to have Robert Spencer, Director of Jihad Watch, join us to discuss, is Islam globally waxing or waning? Mr. Spencer will speak for roughly five to 10 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to all questions, but we have many participants on this webinar, so I apologize in advance if we do not get to yours today. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Robert Spencer. Thank you, Stacy, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, in considering the question, is Islam globally waxing or waning? That is, has Islam diminished as a political force today? It's useful to consider some background to our present situation. Some time ago, for example, a Muslim leader arose who claimed that the Islamic authorities were corrupt and had strayed from authentic Islam. His group gained control of some territory and he proclaimed himself the leader of all the Muslims. In its domains, his group instituted strict observance of Islamic law, Sharia, including the sexual enslavement of infidel women and oppressed the non-Muslims. Now you might think that I'm talking about ISIS. And I could be, but actually every detail of the capsule summary that I just gave you is true also of a group known as the Almohads or monotheists who took power in North Africa in the year 1147. And over the next 25 years gained control of Al-Andalus, that is Muslim Spain. And the point is of course that we see this phenomenon throughout Islamic history as I demonstrate in the book, The History of Jihad, we see periods in which the influence of Islamic teachings is paramount and supreme, and periods in which that interest wanes to the degree that a revivalist movement then arises. Now, much of this stems from the fact that the Quran teaches that if you obey Allah, you will prosper in this world, and that if you do not obey Allah, you will be punished in this world, as well as, of course, in the next. So this has led throughout Islamic history to various kinds of misfortunes being ascribed to a lack of piety and to the rise of revivalist movements that promised to turn away Allah's wrath by restoring the people to the proper and full observance of Islamic regulations. And thus, uh, then, Islam, throughout Islamic history, excuse me, throughout Islamic history, misfortunes are thereby ascribed to a lack of piety and the revivalist movements fix all that. So then on the other hand, when Sharia restrictions become too onerous, they're relaxed because after all, human nature is everywhere the same. And uh, the great majority of Muslims don't wanna live under Sharia any more than anybody else does. So the restrictions are relaxed and a period of moderation follows until some misfortune triggers a new revival movement that describes the troubles, once again, to a lack of Islamic rigor. So today we see movements in both directions. We see a movement toward the relaxation of this Islamic rigor in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And that is, of course, among the people, not the regime, but the regime is in the view of many on its last legs precisely because people have lived under Sharia now for 40 some years. They're tired of living this way. They, some people still remember the days of the Shah and they want to throw off the Islamic regime as we've even seen some demonstrators say outright. Uh, this, the opposing movement we see in Turkey for example, where President Erdogan is working hard to dismantle Turkish secularism and even to restore the Ottoman Caliphate. And so the secularism, which never was very popular outside of Istanbul and Ankara, is now severely threatened and Erdogan is quite efficiently and systematically working to uh, uh, dismantle all the traditional locuses of resistance to the uh, re-imposition re of Islamic law, notably the, in the leadership of the military. Now, if we were to look at the same situations in Iran and Turkey in another few generations, probably we would see the same movements again in reverse. For example, also a hundred years ago, the ascendancy of Western values in the Islamic world looked more or less assured. It looked as if 
jihad terror was a thing of the past. The caliphates were a thing of the past. The, calif the last caliphate was abolished long after it became just a figurehead anyway. The caliphate was abolished. Turkish secularism prevailed. The Shah of Iran followed Turkey's lead. And everywhere, Muslim women were dressing in a Western style, and it looked as if Sharia was a thing of the past. I, uh, there's a notorious video that you can readily see on YouTube of uh, the Egyptian President Nasser in the 1950s joking about the Muslim Brotherhood demanding that women wear hijab and saying their daughters don't wear it. And just let's see them try to convince Egyptian women to wear it. Of course, nowadays, you have uh, most Egyptian women wearing the hijab. And so what Nasser was joking about and thinking inconceivable has come to pass. As long as the fundamental principles of Islam remain the same, particularly in regard to the punishment in this world for, misfortune, for uh, disobedience, and then the ascribing of various misfortunes to that disobedience as a result, uh, as long as these ideas remain influential, we're gonna see the same cycle. So is Islam globally waxing or waning? Yes. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them now. Thank you so much, Mr. Spencer. The first question we have is, is the pandemic helping or hurting the jihadist cause? Uh, once again, the, exam the answer is yes. It is helping or hurting the jihadist cause. I give you some specifics on both. Uh, the jihadist cause has been considerably emboldened as a result of the pandemic. We see Al-Qaeda and ISIS both have termed the virus a, a soldier of Allah and have called on Muslims in, uh, and uh, Muslims also have in, who are not part of ISIS and Al-Qaeda have called upon their co-religionists to weaponize the virus, to use it against infidels if they get infected. Many Islamic leaders around the world, although by no means most, have said that the virus is, uh, something that is Allah's judgment on the infidels and once again counseled prayer and Islamic piety as the remedy to it. And now at the same time, that means that some Muslims are going to think all they have to do is pray or lick an Islamic shrine as we've seen in Iran or something of that nature and then they'll be saved from the virus. Then they're gonna get it and that's gonna create some disillusion. On the other hand, this kind of piety is, is in a certain sense irrefutable and self-reinforcing because most likely or more likely instead of being disillusioned with the religious leaders that have been following muslims who get the coronavirus after believing that they could not possibly get it will likely just think that they weren't praying hard enough weren't being pious enough and redouble their efforts to please allah thank you do you see nato taking action to pressure turkey for its increasing support of hamas and making turkey a spiritual home for the muslim brotherhood also, what keeps Turkey's membership in NATO so well protected? Turkey is protected by the European Union. The European Union uh, is very clear, the leadership anyway, that uh, they want Turkey in the European Union. They don't want it out of NATO. And so consequently, they uh, will they turn a blind eye to all this. Uh, the Euro-Arab agreements dating back to the 1970s also commit the European Union to various forms of cultural, societal, and political cooperation with the Arab League. And that has led to an increasing opposition to Israel itself within the European Union. So when Turkey cozies up to Hamas and tolerates Hamas activity, there's not really a whole lot of pushback in Europe to that, at least once again, among the leadership in Western Europe. So uh, I don't think that NATO is gonna act against this because of the European powers that are uh, essentially driving the car there in NATO, despite the pushback from the president. How much do you see uh, ethnicity influence the jo global jihad movement? There, is a, there are a variety of aspects to that. One is that non-Arab Muslims generally, uh, if they are pious and devout, tend to uh, uh, become even more fanatical 
than the Arabs. Uh, Islam is in many ways a vehicle for Arab supremacism. If you convert to Islam, you generally take an Arabic name, you have to pray in Arabic. The leading figures are, of course, Arabs. The caliph of the Muslims and Sunni theology has to be a member of the Quraysh Arab tribe, and so on and so on. So if you're a Pakistani, non-Arab, or an Iranian, uh, there's a tendency to try to out-Arab the Arabs by being even more Islamic than they are. And this is, I think, one reason why we see such a virulence in Islamic practice in Pakistan in particular, as well as in some other areas that are not Arab, like Afghanistan, as well as Iran. Uh, at the same time, in, in Iran also, there is the counter movement, as there is so often, because the uh, Persians had a great history before the advent of Islam. And increasingly, as the Islamic Republic continues to fail and grow more unpopular, more and more Iranians are harking back to that history, including converting to Zoroastrianism, which was driven out, largely driven out of Iran centuries ago. By the, by the Muslims, but it's considered to be, of course, the ancestral religion of the Iranians, and so many Iranians are returning to it. If you are a, an, an Arabian Arab, you don't really have anything but Islam to uh, form part of your cultural heritage, and so the Iranian dissidents can fall back upon their uh, non-Arab traditions, their pre-Islamic traditions, uh, as a locus for the dissent against the regime. Thank you. Do you feel that supporting creation of an independent Kurdistan in northeast Syria would help to oppose Erdogan's expansionism along with that of Iran and Russia? Yeah, absolutely it would. Uh, the Kurds have been dealt a very bad hand. They were promised a, nationals, a national home at the same time that the Jews were promised a national home at the end of World War I. And of course, the Brit Brit British as always, or as so often, I should say, reneged on the promise there never was an independent Kurdistan but it would allow for Kurdish forces to uh, gain a great deal more international support against the Turks and to marshal world opinion at the UN and elsewhere against what they're doing there. Thank you. So is there a moderate Islam and is that waxing or waning? Uh, I don't believe that there is a moderate Islam. There are moderate Muslims, but there is no moderate Islam. This is a distinction that is incredibly muddled today. People don't seem to be capable anymore of distinguishing between the belief system, the ideology, and the people. But the reality of the unfortunate reality of the Quran and Sunnah, as they have been interpreted over 1400 years, among all the sects and schools of jurisprudence, is that they all teach warfare against unbelievers and the necessity to subjugate those unbelievers under the rule of Islamic law. Now, does this mean that each and every Muslim is committed to that? Of course not. Not any more than every Christian loves his enemies and turns the other cheek. Uh, the reality of the individual observance of any particular Muslim is informed by a great many things besides Islam. Everybody has a variety of perspectives, a variety of priorities, a variety of influences. And so there are plenty of Muslims around the world who have no intention of waging jihad against unbelievers and never will. And for that, of course, we can all be glad. But there is no uh, traditional form of Islam that does not contain the elements mandating this jihad imperative against unbelievers. Wonderful answer. Um, so there have been talks about protests in Iran, like in 2011, and the regime there falling. What are the chances of this happening? Oh, I think they're very, there's a very great chance of the regime falling. Uh, I've seen some extraordinary things coming out of Iran recently. Saw a video not long ago of an entire stadium full of people uh, there for a soccer game chanting, long live Reza Shah. Uh, Reza Shah being the father of the Shah of Iran, who was deposed by Khomeini in 1979. And by chanting such a thing, they're saying we don't want an Islamic Republic, which is something also that some of the demonstrators in Iran have uh, chanted in, uh, explicitly in recent weeks. So the problem, of course, is that the Iranian regime is so ruthless that there is no opposition that can form 
There's no political opposition that can organize itself at all. The kind of situation that allowed for Khomeini to be able to mobilize people against the Shah in the first place, the, the, the Islamic Republic is making sure it's not replicated. But there are so many people, and in, I think every day there are more Iranians who hate the regime. I don't think it can possibly withstand the pressure of that indefinitely. Wonderful, and I think this will be our last question. How far will the left move towards Islamic lobbies as opposed to Israeli or Jewish lobbies? As far as you can go. Uh, the pretty much already the left has done this. Uh, it seems to be a priority that they've chosen of anti-American, of opposition, of anti-Americanism, opposition to the Judeo-Christian tradition, opposition to the United States as a political and moral force in the world. And uh, consequently, they see in Islam ideological allies in the sense of here's a force that's been for 1400 years at war with the West, and they are essentially at war with the West. So they see them as ideological kin. Thank you so much. And as a closing note, what can we do to help this? What can we do to help what? Uh, just the, the waxing and waning and then try and move towards the ideals that we're looking for. Well, I think there's a great deal of, in general, a great deal of unreality about the issues regarding the global jihad today. A great deal of wishful thinking, a great deal of denial of plain facts. Uh, of course, no, most notoriously, the Obama administration in 2011 uh, removed all mention of Islam and jihad from counter-terror training materials. So that means that intelligence agents and law enforcement uh, operatives ever since then have not been able to even study, at least under official auspices, the motivating ideology behind jihad terrorism. So I think a return to realism would be most wel welcome and tremendously helpful at this point. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with us. We have come, sorry, we have come to the close of our webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, next week, we'll have Dr. Jonathan Schwanzer join us on Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern to speak on the cause of the Middle East next war. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.